Hello everyone, my name is Elaine Stafford and you're very welcome to KPMG's podcast Conversations with Auditors, the podcast where we explore the relevant issues, opportunities and new ways of working that are shaping the future of our profession. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Maria Flannery. Maria is an audit partner in our asset management group and leads our blockchain and digital assets working group which sits in our financial services audit sector. Today, Maria is going to talk to us a little bit about this new technology and digital asset group. Maria, firstly, to kick things off today, Maria, you might explain for our listeners what exactly is blockchain. Some people might be hearing about it for the first time. Others might have heard about it before, but not really sure what it is. Of course. Uh, thanks, Elaine. So the blockchain, it's uh, it's essentially a, a shared ledger. So it, it facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets across a um, across multiple parties in a network of, of computers. Um, when you hear the term distributed ledger technology or DLT, that essentially just means blockchain technology. So the idea is you don't have a central record um, um, of, or a ledger essentially with, say, a business or within a bank. Um, rather, you distribute copies of the ledger um, across the world. So each owner of each copy records each transaction. And that brings me to the next point, which is uh, the consensus algorithm. So this is the technology underpinning the blockchain is the consensus algorithm and consensus across all parties um, on the blockchain is what's used to to achieve agreement, trust and security um, across across the full blockchain. Um, a transaction can't be processed without consensus across all parties. And once that consensus is achieved, then that transaction on the blockchain becomes immutable. It can never it can never be altered or reversed. Um, so there can be public block blockchains such as the Bitcoin blockchain mm -hmm. would, would have been the first one that came came into um, existence. Um, but there's also private blockchains now which have become popular, which have a, a closed pool of, of participants. OK, you mentioned Bitcoin there. You might tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, Bitcoin is it's it's a cryptocurrency. So it's um, it's sometimes easier to imagine blockchain as being like an operating system similar to Windows and cryptocurrencies are essentially applications that run on the on the operating system. So cryptocurrencies are a, a byproduct in some ways of, uh, of blockchain technology. Um, so Bitcoin is a digital or a virtual currency. Um, it acts as a form of payment or a store of value, um, but unlike fiat currency like your euro, USD, mm -hmm. GBP, it's um, it's 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 not issued by a central bank and it's not backed by a central bank. More importantly, um, it's created, um, traded, and stored on on the blockchain itself. Um, so Bitcoin was the first and one of the original currencies and still retains the largest market share of uh, of the cryptocurrency market. Um, it can be used as a form of payment. There is actually uh, a very famous story about a guy who uh, who bought two pizzas with uh, using 10,000 Bitcoin at the time, a, a good few years ago. Um, at the time, uh, that's equivalent to about four billion dollars of uh, wow. at the height of Bitcoin's value. So uh, and that's a, it's one of the one of the more famous stories of, uh, of the evolution of Bitcoin. Um, but um, regardless of, of, of using it as a payment, it's increasingly been viewed as a, as a longer term uh, in, in investment product. Um, Bitcoin has been around since 2009. It's well known for its volatility and it, it derives its value based on supply and demand. So um, the price is therefore, you know, it's it's increased a lot in, in recent years due to the increased interest in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, the price of Bitcoin, it uh, breached $1,000 in 2017 and uh, and then was as high as forty seven thousand um, dollars at the start of 2022. That was at the height of its uh, height of its value. Um, up to that point, many believed the price would continue to climb and uh, and a lot of investors were buying to hold. Um, so this did increase investor demand, which led to a lot of institutional investors, um, you know, getting involved. Um, but Bitcoin's only one cryptocurrency. There's about nine thousand other cryptocurrencies out there. Um, with Ether, the um, Ethereum bit, uh, Ethereum cryptocurrency, being the second largest by by market share. Okay, so huge huge volatility in in the value there. Is there other digital assets out there then that you can tell me about? 
Yeah, there are a number that have evolved over over the course of the last few years. So there are stable coins which are um, which are pegged to fiat currency. So some examples of those would be USDC and and Tether. They'd be probably two of the most prominent uh, USD pegged uh, stable coins. Um, there are also security tokens which um, they're like shares and they represent. Um, an interest in an underlying asset. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discussion lately about the possibility of a euro or a UK um, CBDC, so a central bank uh, digital um, digital currency. So that would be a digital currency produced by and minted by a central bank, which is really interesting because it would be backed by a central bank. Um, so similar to fiat currency, but, but in a digital form. Uh, both the EU and the UK have initiated projects to investigate the potential of uh, of, of producing a, a digital euro and a digital uh, a digital sterling, which is is going to be very interesting. Um, there are also NFTs, non fungible tokens. You may have heard a lot about over the last couple of years. Uh, they're essentially um, they're essentially a unique cryptographic token on the blockchain that can't be replicated. So. They're um, they're not necessarily like cryptocurrency, but they're um, they're used to represent um, real world items such as such as artwork. So you hear a lot about them in the in the art world at the moment. Um, and the idea is if, if Bitcoin is the digital answer to currency, then NFTs essentially are the digital answer to collectibles. Um, but a digital asset at the end of the day is essentially anything in digital form which can be used. Um, to create value by tokenizing it on, on a blockchain. That's really interesting. And some of those then would be far less volatile than say Bitcoin has been in the past. Exactly. So we're hearing loads about crypto in the news. Um, what, why is that then? What, why is it so popular at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's been very newsworthy at the moment. Um, so, I mean, there's the saying that there are decades where nothing happens and then weeks where decades happen and certainly in the world of, of crypto and blockchain um, that's certainly very true based on activity in recent years um, I suppose it, it probably you know it was a slow burner in the early years but um, during the COVID pandemic of 2020 and 2021 the market capitalization of crypto increased from 200 billion dollars to 2 trillion dollars just in the space of, of the COVID pandemic um, this was partly driven by a combination of, um, of cheap money with very low interest rates, um, government stimulus packages, uh, and, um, and also novice investors who were, who were trading at home and learning how to trade during lockdowns uh, um, to, uh, from pure boredom. Um, but there was also the global shift to embrace new technologies, which, which helped drive that as well, which came about during COVID-19. Um, so you started to see a lot, a huge increase in crypto trading over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and crypto trading became more mainstream and as it became more mainstream, investor demand increased and, you know, based on that and hyperinflation fears, it forced those with even the most traditional investment strategies to consider alternative investments such as, as Bitcoin and, um, and digital assets. Um, then we go into 2022 and as interest rates hiked and due to the fact that, uh, that, that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are very high on the risk scale as an asset class, um, the price of Bitcoin started to drop, which had a knock on effect on the, uh, the stablecoin Terra. So you may remember the, um, the news articles around the time May 2022 during the Ter Terra Luna crash, which uh, over the course of 24 hours, $40 billion was, was knocked off the, uh, the, the crypto capitalization. Um, the rest of 2022 then saw the collapse of, um, of large crypto firms such as Three Arrows Capital and Celsius um, and most famously FTX. Wow, huge numbers there. And FTX, can you tell me a little bit more about what happened there then? Yeah, of course. Um, so FTX was founded in 2019 by Sam Bankman-Fried. He was only 27 when he when he founded this firm. Um, he had previously co-founded Alameda Research, which is um, it's essentially a crypto fund. Um, Alameda was a prominent um, market maker in in crypto exchanges, and uh, and FTX subsequently became one of the largest crypto exchanges in in the world. Um, in November 2022, a report came out by, by Coindesk, which raised concerns about potential leverage and solvency issues within FTX. 
um, in particular that 40% of Alameda, the fund's um, assets, were in FTX's own token, FTT. Um, this resulted in Binance uh, liquidating. Uh, it, it had about half a billion of a holding of F FTT, the token, at the time. That then uh, predicated a run on FTT and uh, the, the subsequent bankruptcy of FTX. Um, this happened at a time when you know we were already in the middle of a bear market, or what's known as the crypto winter, um, where cryptocurrencies had you know had lost about two trillion in value since uh, since the highs of early 2022 to the end of 2022. Wow. So, what do you think then that fall of FTX means for crypto and blockchain? It's interesting. Like there's. Um, there's there's widespread acceptance that the uh, the you know the failing of FTX and the collapse of FTX was was primarily driven by um, significant corporate failings, um, as opposed to a failing of the underlying technology around cryptocurrency itself. Um, it's quite common for new and emerging markets to um, to experience high level of volatility, and this can this can sometimes expose sometimes the vulnerabilities of, of business models of the new entities set up for these in these ecosystems. Um, with regard to FTX in particular, there were a number of significant issues uh, that were ex that were exposed, um, which were brought to light during during the the, the crypto crash. Um, for instance, uh, there was commingling of company and customer funds uh, within within FTX. Um, in traditional finance, the segregation of, of client and, and company assets is it's a crucial safeguard um, that wouldn't exist in, in a regulated uh, in a regulated market. Um, there was a near total absence of, of corporate uh, corporate governance within the organization, so the board comprised young, inexperienced and unsophisticated um, people, you know, based in, in the Bahamas. Um, there was also a complete lack of records. So there was no accounting function. There was no CFO um, and there were no risk management policies or frameworks in place. Um, John Ray, who is a uh, he's a US um, corporate restructuring expert, he was appointed, subsequently appointed as the CEO of FTX um, when, when uh, following the bankruptcy. Um, he actually worked on the Enron, uh, the Enron bankruptcy as well. So with plenty of experience and plenty of knowledge. And even having seen what he saw at Enron, he said that he had never in his career seen such complete failure of corporate controls as he had seen at FTX, um, which really speaks volumes. Um, what this means for the future of crypto and of blockchain and digital assets is really difficult to tell at this stage. I mean, the European authorities, including ESMA, have indicated their view that um, the FTX case isn't specific to digital assets, but is rather the unregulated ecosystem that digital assets operate in um, with a lack of mandated governance and, um, and regulation. So do we or do you think that we need to have regulation introduced here, that the regulatory landscape needs to change? Um, in, in a short answer, yes, um, it is interesting. I mean, the um, the implosion of FDX obviously um, increased the focus on regulating regulating the market and the regulators that were previously maybe cautious, um, they're now being forced to to move a bit quicker and and increase it on the on on the agenda. Um, perhaps surprisingly, regulation is being welcomed by many within the crypto industry. I mean, regulation will bring standards. And standards will eventually bring wider adoption, mm -hmm. um, and wider adoption is key to the success of this asset class. So many, many within the crypto uh, industry realize that they need regulation in order to in order to succeed. Um, Europe has published um, a wide-ranging regulatory framework called called Mika um, for all member states as part of the, uh, the European Commission's digital finance strategy. Um, so Mika is intended to help harmonize um, the EU, EU market when it comes to, to crypto policies um, and to provide a single licensing regime across all member states by next year, 2024. Uh, the UK has recently really started to embrace um, this sector. The UK government has very publicly uh, stated its intention to become a global crypto hub. Um, and at the start of February, it, uh, it published proposals on how it tends to robustly regulate the sector while also harnessing the potential for uh, you know for the embracing the new technologies and new crypto technologies. 
um, the Central Bank of Ireland has released a number of warnings over the past couple of years relating to crypto investments. Um, however, it has approved in the last couple of months, it's approved quite a number of uh, virtual asset service providers, which is which is really positive. Um, also in 2021, worth noting that it did uh, it did say that Irish quaifs could gain exposure to crypto assets, provided the fund manager can demonstrate how the associate how the associated risks can be managed effectively. Um, so that's really, really interesting. What's certain is that FTX and um, and the recent failings that we've seen in the crypto industry, that, uh, you know, they've really brought the topic higher up on regulators agenda around the world. Um, and, and that's a positive thing because regulation will ultimately um, help to protect investors. So what impact then, Maria, do you think that this new technology will have for your clients and for asset management in general, the industry? Um, it's probably, I see it being twofold. So, I mean, in recent years, there's been increased demand um, from investors to get access to more alternative investments um, and to gain exposure to the likes of, uh, of, of digital assets. Um, and this has brought some of the more traditional institutional players in, in, into the market. Um, there are investments funds which already invest directly in, in crypto assets or digital assets or else invest them through swaps and, and futures products. Um, this gained a lot of traction in, you know, from kind of 2020 up to early 2022, but uh, it's eased back a little bit in the, in, in the current bear market. Um, but the what's interesting is the evolution of the ecosystem to facilitate the adoption of digital assets has seen new operators come into the market um particularly after the ftx fallout the focus on the custody of assets and and the segregation of assets has become you know a focus point and um and the risks around those and the entry of uh of third party custodians into the market specifically to uh to uh safe keep digital assets is um is something that we're we're seeing that's uh, it's very new and very interesting um the second significant area impacting the asset management industry is the adoption of the actual the underlying tech mm -hmm. we're seeing a significant amount of activity uh, with the traditional finance in the tr traditional finance world with um, traditional banks which are now embracing blockchain technology um, if if not necessarily crypto itself but certainly the technology um, tokenization is something we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of big players take a real interest in um, and this is what I'm expecting to see have a, a significant impact on on the asset management industry tokenization is um, it refers to a traditional security or asset that is wrapped in the latest technology. So the concept of traditional tra traditional asset fractionalization isn't anything new. Um, you know, we've seen it in the likes of the likes of ETFs and other types of REITs, etc. Um, however, tokeni tokenizing an asset uh, on a blockchain, which means essentially creating a digital a digital uh, representation of the asset, um, could possibly remove some of the uh, limitations of traditional asset fractionalization such as you know manual processes um whether it's slow costly or lacking transparency is particularly within the private markets um so tokenization really presents an opportunity um to remove some of the as uh, of the obstacles of um of asset illiquidity and to and to open it to the wider to the wider market um, so this has the potential very much to be the next big thing within the asset management industry. So what does KPMG do to help clients in this space? Uh, so we've we've a digital assets team um, here within KPMG, which we're linked into our, our wider KPMG network, international network. Um, so we support clients in exploring the potential benefits to them of um, of of digital assets or the or the underlying technologies. Um, we help clients prepare for audit, tax, you know, regulatory requirements. Um, so this includes the initial initial tax restructuring when initially getting set up, as well as um, supporting clients in dealing with the, the tax nuances that uh, that exist with this new asset class, which there's no specific tax legislation for. Um, our regulatory team supports clients in in gaining. Um, central bank authorization um, and also in meeting their ongoing regulatory uh, regulatory requirements. Um, also, given there's no specific IFRS 
guidance or standard um, to address uh, digital assets specifically um, or specialized accounting advisory team advise clients in terms of the accounting treatment of, of digital assets that they're either holding or trading. Maria, thank you very much for joining us here today. And thank you to all of our listeners. If any of our listeners have a question on any of the topics discussed here today, please feel free to reach out to Maria or a member of her team or your usual KPMG contact. Thank you.